Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This week's series of messages is by Rev. Dr. James Chung, our special guest for Spiritual Emphasis Week. Dr. Chung serves as Vice President of Strategy and Innovation at University Christian Fellowship USA, overseeing evangelism, discipleship, growth, missions, and multi-ethnic initiatives. He is the author of True Story, A Christianity Worth Believing In, and Real Life, A Christianity Worth Living Out. He received his D-Min from Fuller Theological Seminary and has had his work featured in Christianity Today, Leadership Journal, Outreach Magazine, and ExploreGod.com. His visit is funded by an endowment from the Thomas F. Staley Foundation. Uh, Well, good. Uh, This week, uh, we've been here together. We're exploring the places where faith intersect life in in a deep and real and honest way. And so yesterday, we talked about the context of that and how that works out. And in particular, we dived into generational stuff. And we had grandparents here, which was great to talk about that. I had lots of grandparents coming up to me who really liked it. None of you guys did, but the grandparents really did. (laughs) Just kidding. And so we talked about that, and that's really the context that we're in. And then this, this morning, I want to talk more about the hope of that. What could we yearn for? And then tomorrow, I'll talk about our response to that. And that's, that's the, I had heard that I've, I've accidentally stumbled onto a head, heart, and hand. And that means something to you here at JVU. So that's great. Um, so this is what I want to do. Let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Um, So, Father, thank you for being here. Your spirit is here among us. As we've worshipped you, as we've praised you, you are here among us and you live in us. And so, Father, if I say anything that is from you, would you allow that to take root in our hearts, to change us and to make us more like you? And if I say anything that is not from you, would you keep the gray matter in their brains from receiving any of it so that only your word would remain? It's always been about you, is about you, will be about you. And so, Lord, would you speak and help us to hear what you have to say this morning? And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, this is going to be odd. What I want to talk about this morning uh, is revival. And uh, let me skip ahead. Uh, and I feel a bit sheepish talking about revival because it's not a neutral word. It's not something you say and people go like, eh, whatever. Uh, you, some of you hear that word and it's, it elicits a lot of excitement about what could be, the possibilities that are there. And then others of you hear that word and you cringe because you're like, oh, I don't want to hear another preacher talk about that again. And to be honest, I'm more of the old I'm more on that latter stage. I'm more like that person. Um, I grew up in a Korean-American church uh, in a suburb of Seattle, Washington. And it was was a pretty well-to-do church. There were a lot of uh, nice new cars in the parking lot. Um, But people were pretty earnest in their faith. And we just always talked about revival all the time. I was often at church. My parents were both very committed and did a lot of things, whether it was choir or, clean, or cooking in the kitchen or other kinds of service activities through the church. We were there two, three, four times a week. So I grew up in the church often uh, being there. And there was always this talk of revival. So what would happen is anything that didn't happen on a Sunday, they would call a revival meeting. Right? So if they had a guest speaker, it'd be a revival meeting. Something like this would be a revival meeting. If you had a retreat, you would call that a revival meeting. Just almost everything was revival, revival, revival all the time. And it drove me nuts because it made it feel like they were trying to stir some manipul- They were trying to stir up some emotions. They were trying to be a bit manipulative with that word. And it, it really drove me crazy. And so much so... And I, I hate to admit this, the first time I ever spoke outside of my ministry context, I spoke against revival. My first ever sermon. I remember where I was. I was up in the mountains near Colorado Springs. We were about 10,000 feet up where a flight of stairs would just have you so winded because of the altitude. 
And while I was there, I remember they actually put me under a tent, like an old revival meeting tent of old. And students from about nine or 10 states were all gathering under this tent. And I took my entire time that evening to talk about why you should not seek revival, why chasing it is wrong, and that we should all just be faithful. That's what I did. And now for those folks, you guys wouldn't have been there. I have to go around the country and just ask for forgiveness because I believe that I was wrong. And as I think about our country, as I think about where we are at this time and place where fear and contempt seems to have the day that given what's happening in politics, whether you're on the right or from the left, neither feels like things are going well, that the leadership is doing great, that there are things that are happening. There isn't a whole lot of folks today that are saying, you know what's happening in America today? It's incredible. I love it. It's a great time to be an American. There isn't that sense in our culture, in our community. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty tough time when violence can enter into elementary schools in a heartbeat or when things are just happening all around. It's easy to lose hope. And then we don't have to keep it up here, right? You, we can look at our families. We can look at our relationships. We can look at our own lives. And there's a lot of places where we would hope for hope we want to dare to hope, and yet hope feels elusive. And so what do we do in these kinds of spaces when it just feels like things are going wrong? Well, it's with that that I, I want to, uh, there's a prayer in the scriptures out of Psalm 85 that really is a prayer that is prayed in the midst of things that are dark and desolate. It's, it was a psalm that they don't know who the author was, but it was written clearly to a community that's going through a hard time or some place of desolation. And they prayed this prayer. It was a communal prayer. It was a prayer that wasn't just the expression of an individual person's heart, we know from the subtitle, but it's a prayer that's meant for the director of music. And so this was a communal thing that they prayed in a hard time. And I just feel like there's something here that we could take away and maybe find ways to seek hope again. So not my phone. (laughs) <laughs> but this is what we want to get to. So it says in this passage, uh, as they're praying, it's a general prayer. It's a prayer that's likely given to a post-exilic community. So basically after Israel has come back from captivity and from uh, oppressed by Babylon, they come back to their own land. This is likely when it was written, but scholars aren't quite sure when it was written. And it was written to a community that was in trouble. And so this is what the psalmist uh, penned. Here for us to pray. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. And in this stanza, what the, the psalmist is doing, he's looking back to the past and going back to understand, well, how did God operate before? And in the past, looking back to that, he prays and prays a prayer of remembrance of the ways that God showed favor to the land and brought them back out of captivity, that they restored the fortunes of, his, of their people, that he forgave their sins, covered over them, set aside his wrath, and turned from his anger so that they could have the land again. And so what we do when we're in trouble The first thing as we pray is to keep remembering what God has already done, to remember who he is in the time of trouble so that we can then remind ourselves of what God could do in the present. And I just remember as we're writing this book on revival and trying to think through different places, we looked all around the world. And there's one story that I just love talking about because it's connected to me personally. And this happened in the Korean Peninsula about 1907. It was a time when the Japanese were starting to take over, but they hadn't officially yet occupied the land. And they would at some point for almost 30 years occupy a land and be brutal in their persecution um, of people uh, as they would be there of the Korean people. So it was a time when that was happening. The Korean people were feeling stepped on by the Japanese. But in the middle of all of this, there were some Presbyterian and Methodist missionaries that were doing some work with a nascent church in Korea where there weren't that many Protestants at the time. And so there was a Methodist missionary named R.A. Hardy who um, was in Wonsan. So North, imagine North Korea, the east coast of North Korea. And R.A. Hardy is a burned out medical missionary from Canada. 
And he's gathered a crew of people, um, national leader, Korean national leaders of himself, or just a group of Christians, really. There weren't that many folks at, uh, at the time. And as they got together at a retreat to pray, R.A. Hardy just feels like he just needs to confess that he's burned out. And he started to just share that. And then he confessed the sins that he was carrying. And for the Korean people, it was weird to see someone of that stature sort of confess and be honest with where he was. And so that sort of opened up the floodgates and everyone started confessing their sins and asking for more of God. And a, a little mini revival took place in this retreat on Wonsan, on Wonsan which is on the east coast of, Korea, of North Korea. Well, people heard about that and little pockets started showing up in Seoul and in different parts of the country. And then there started this bubbling up and missionary work was happening and churches were being planted so much so they got to this point where in Pyongyang, so in the capital of what is now known as North Korea, not quite known for its Christian heritage, you know what I mean? But right there in the capital city, they were able to gather about 1,500 people to, to, for a week of studying the scriptures and of prayer. And at night, they would open this up to the public. And what happened on one particular night in January in 1907 is that all of a sudden, they're there, they're praying. The night before, it was dead. Nothing was happening. So all the missionaries and leaders really started praying more and asking God to break through that evening. And then when they got there, God actually surprised them in this crazy way. They were all up there and they were sharing their prayer requests. And then all, they, were, they were about to turn people into prayer. And then one of the leaders just in front of everyone, a Korean leader confesses that he's hated this other missionary and wanted to confess in front of everyone. Can you just imagine, right? Like me coming up here and confessing how much I hate Tracy, right? I just, <laughs> and then so he gets on his knees and starts asking for his forgiveness in front of everybody. It floors the whole room, right? Because they don't do this in Korean culture. And all of a sudden, a wave of confession hit out and then they started to pray. And one missionary described it as a roar of prayer. If you've ever been around Korean people when they're praying, just everyone's praying out loud at once. And it was this holy rumble started to come across the entire congregation. And from that point, it sparked what is known as the Pyongyang Revivals. And almost every Protestant church in uh, the South Korea, in, in the Korean Peninsula, has a connection to Pyongyang as it blew up. And so much so that South Korea now is the largest missionary force per capita, force per capita in the world. It is wild. The largest churches in the world, the largest Presbyterian church, the largest Methodist church, the largest full gospel church, they're all in Korea. The largest church in the world. Um, back when I last saw the count, had 800,000 people in it. Almost like the state of Rhode Island at one church. And what God was doing in that country is there. It still has its problems, obviously, but from that time in 1907, something broke out. And I'm just wondering if God has been able to do that kind of stuff in the past, would he do it again today? And that throughout Christian history, um, there's a historian, Mark Shaw, who says that revivals have been the, one of the most strategic ways that Christianity, particularly in the 20th century, has surged in the global south. That in some ways it has an ebb and a flow, but revivals are key to seeing the continued move of God in the world today. And that God has done it in the past. Can he do it again today? Well, given that... The psalmist in verses 1 through 3 prays in the past, and then in Psalms in verses 4 through 7 prays a prayer that's meant for the present. And the psalmist says this, Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. And in this prayer, he's asking for a restoration now and a revival now. And to ask for something to be revived is the sense that something was down and out and then revived, that something was dead and now is coming on alive. It was a prayer in faith speak for resurrection of something and that this prayer prayed in a time of, of hard times for the, for the Jewish people was a prayer for restoration and for revival and for God 
to move. And how could we potentially be praying for revival today? Now, before we go there, revival, what does that mean? And what do I mean by that? Because a lot of people use it and it's a little bit crazy. Um, so a definition that I want to bring up, this is something that we're using in InterVarsity to help explain it so that we can have really revival for the rest of us. So it's not just for like the crazies, whichever, where you want to put them on the, the spectrum, right? You know who I'm talking about. Um, so we believe that revival, if we're just looking through history, it's a season of breakthrough. It doesn't last forever, but it's where God breaks through. And uh, this itself could be a 30-minute talk, so I just want to go through it quickly. Is that it's a season of breakthrough in word, deed, and power. So full gospel where it's the word um, studied and preached rightly, a deed and compassion and justice, and really power, reliance on God's spirit to do things that you just can't explain with normal, normal rationality because God is on the move. That ushers in a new normal so it's a breakthrough that happens with the full gospel that actually elevates a sense of expectancy, right? That you're like, wow, God can move this way? And you're almost disappointed that God doesn't move the same way, right? If you can imagine being part of a community where maybe one or two, no one becomes a Christian in a given year, which a lot of our churches do, and I forget the exact percentage. But then all of a sudden there's a trickle and maybe one or two people start coming, becoming Christian about once a month. And then a while might grow to like five or six, let's say. If you then went from there and then dropped back down to a community that saw nobody come to faith, I think you'd start to be disappointed. That's the idea of a new normal where you've experienced something of the Lord and his breakthrough and it brings in a sense of new normal, a new expectancy of what God would do of kingdom experience and fruitfulness. And what we mean by that is just in and out. There's something that happens inside of us that allows us to receive and experience and be revived on the inside, but it has impact in the, in the ministry and in our lives around us. And so a season of breakthrough and word, deed, and power that ushers in a new normal of kingdom experience and fruitfulness it's a kind of a normal way to say, we're not just trying to stoke emotions. We don't want just people to feel like, wow, this is so exciting. Though that might happen, what's more important is that God is breaking through for a period of time and doesn't last forever in word, deed, and power that creates a new sense of expectancy about what God can do in us and through us. And that's what we mean by revival. And in that what would it look like to pray for that and why and how could we do that because as we've looked throughout history and this is going to make total sense to you right there's no revival in history that has happened without revived leaders no revival in history has happened without revived leaders that should make a lot of sense right so much so that we would have to say it in that way that um, one uh, evangelist, Gypsy Smith, would say, if you want to see revival in your lifetime and you want to know how to start it, go into a closet, draw a chalk circle around yourself, and then ask revival to start within that circle. Because we won't see revival unless we are revived. And hence we're going right in the prayer here in, in Psalm 85. How could we pray for breakthrough? Would it be okay for us to be praying for breakthrough so that we would be revived? If we want to see revival in the communities and world around us, how are we asking God to revive us? Because we need to also find ourselves. That we've got to become the kind of change we want to see in the world around us. So in the psalmist, the psalmist prays and reminds the, himself of what God has already done. And in verses 4 through 7, then asks God to do something in the present. Then we see what happens in the future uh, in verses 11 through 13. And I think it actually goes on to 16. So faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord indeed will give what is good. I think we're missing some verses. Let's go back to verse 8. Sorry about that. And I will go back and look for it here. So in Psalm 85, here we are. Uh, Psalm 85. It's a little harder than a book. Okay. In verse 8, it says this. I will listen to what, the, what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people. as the word shalom there. His faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. 
in verse 10. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness goes down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. And what you have here in verses 8 through 13 is this incredible picture. It's not just God showing up in that day, but you have language like love in verse 10, which is the word has said in the original language. It's this idea of God's covenant faithfulness, that he's going to be faithful to his promises. And righteousness in verse 10 is this word, it also means justice. Tzedakah. It is the sense of not just me being right with God, but our relationships are right with God and our systems are right with God. There's a rightness to all of it. And peace, shalom. It really is this huge word for the Jewish people in the Old Testament. This sense where what everything that God wants to happen actually happens in this space. And so these pictures of God's covenant love and faithfulness, of the ways that his justice and righteousness will go through the land, in this way that shalom will finally be a part of everything and they're kissing each other. What is this all a picture of? What is the psalmist talking about? I think he's pointing to a future time when everything is made right, when everything is renewed, when everything is fully revived, that this is where we're going. And so... If you hear me right, we are looking and longing for a day and a world that will be fully revived one day. When all of history is written, it will be full on revival constantly that the long arc of history is bending toward revival. It's where the kingdom finally comes and revival will no longer be a season of breakthrough, but it will just be a constant way of life. That it is the renewal of all things and this is where God is taking us. If you can imagine then, that is what makes praying for revival right then. It isn't just about trying to stir something up. We're actually praying in line with God's will to where God is finally going to take us. It is the arc of it all. We're just aligning ourselves with where all of history is being led. And as we pray for revival, we're just praying for the kingdom to come. That's powerful. Uh, you know, uh, I like to play s- something that looks like tennis. <laughs> I'm trying. And, but I love the sport. And my wife knows I love it, so we watch a lot of it, and I try to play it. You know, I wish I was better than I am. But I tell you, you know, if I know, I play tennis at night because I play after my kids go to bed. We just find a, a court with lights, and I'll play with a buddy. If I know I'm going to play tennis, that night, that's going to make my whole day better, right? Because I'm anticipating like, ooh, you know, I have to answer this email, but at nine o'clock I'm playing tennis, so it's going to be okay, right? So I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm having a good time. Similarly, my wife, she's a huge Dodgers fan. You know what I mean? Like huge LA Dodgers fan. I did not know she was like this. I did not know I had married a sports fan, but she listens to every single Dodgers game on the radio, all right? That's kind of how hardcore my wife is. If she knows that she's going to be able to watch a Dodgers game at Dodger Stadium that day, right, that gets her a little excited for the whole day. That will get her through all the, the stuff that she has to do that she reminds me that I should help her with in the house, right? Like all that stuff that has to happen. Tennis and the Dodgers are nothing close to what the kingdom come will be like, right? Like these are just little pleasures of the day, but one day, When all of history is written, we will be at a place where everything is fully revived, where everything is the way it's meant to be. And as we pray, and wouldn't that then, if we know that that's coming, wouldn't that have an impact on the way that we live our lives now? Because it's way better than tennis. It's way better than the Dodgers. This is the kingdom fully realized. And one day we're heading there. Wouldn't that have an impact in the way that we see today? So this is what the psalmist does. In a time of despair and desolation, he reminds himself through prayer who the Lord is and what he's done. And then in verses 4 through 7, prays a prayer of revival and restoration so that 
knowing and by doing that, leaning into the prayers toward the future where it will all one day be made right. So how could we begin to pray for breakthrough in our lives, in our families, in our communities, and in the world around us, and to ask God to fill that with hope? Now, revivals, and I'll end with a story, affects me personally. Um, like I said, almost every Korean Protestant has some spiritual connection to the Pyongyang revivals, and my family is included. Um, and here's the story. My great-great-grandmother was a shaman. She was the spiritual leader of her village, and she took care of a tree shrine about 50 miles north of Pyongyang in a small village called Youngmi. So she took care of this tree, uh, tree shrine, and, but she lost her first kid and her second kid early to, to early deaths. And so she got so mad at the tree spirit that she covered the tree with feces and then cut down the tree. Can you imagine the shaman cutting down the village spirit tree? That's mom, grand, great, great grandmother, right? Like just so feisty Korean mama. I love it. Just like, ah, you did not take care of my family. You know, I just love it. So then I like to picture her sort of sitting near that tree because now it's covered with the wrong stuff. Uh, she's sitting near the tree and this is around 1907. And some people who get lit up spiritually in Pyongyang send a missionary 50 miles north to a little village called Youngmi, and that missionary meets a disgruntled shaman that I think is sitting near the tree and introduces her to Jesus and what he's done. And she gives her life to follow Jesus. That's how Christianity enters my family. She, because she's the shaman, then tells the village about Jesus and the whole village basically becomes Christian because she's the spiritual leader and she plants the first church in this village. That church continues so that my great-grandfather serves as an elder there. My grandparents meet at that church. My dad is infant baptized at that church. When the communists come, his family has to run south. When they run south, my grandfather is part of a church planting team that starts a church in Busan. That church still exists today. Four years later, they run up to Seoul and move there, and they, that same crew plants another church in Seoul, still exists today. My dad then moves to America, uh, brings his bride-to-be with him. They actually go to college. In, my dad goes to college here in Arkansas, of all places. Um, they go up to Chicago. I'm born. When they go to Seattle, they help a fledgling church plant grow into the church that still exists today. And when they send me to Boston, we planted a church in Boston 20 years ago that still exists today. And there's this lineage of spiritual heritage, a spiritual leadership in my clan because revival broke out in the land and helped my great-great-grandmother come to faith. Revivals are important, and they have ways of connecting with us. And so much so that even in the scriptures, when we see of the resilience of Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were likely children during the time of, the, of King Josiah's revivals. And as they grew up in revival, it likely gave them to re the resilience to stand up against the greatest empire of their day, to keep their faith even when faced with threats of fire and lion's, lion's dens. Revivals have a way of waking us up, bringing us forth, and a chance to see God move in powerful ways. So John Brown. Would you join me in praying with the psalmist in Psalm 85 to remind ourselves of the ways God has moved, to ask God to move again in a new way, knowing that we're praying in the arc of history and asking God to come in his fullness. Let's pray. Well, Holy Spirit, would you take that word and uh, help us receive what you have for us? That, Lord, we know that in history's revival started with revived people. And so, Lord, for those of us in the room that just feel like a strong tug in our spirit on what's being said this morning, would you show us what does it mean to pray for breakthrough, to pray for revival, to ask you to start revival in us so that we can come to you and see you move in us.
God, there are a lot of folks in this room that don't really sense that they're deeply connected to you. There are people in this room that feel like you've been a little bit far away. There are people in this room that have lost hope in the ways that you can move in their families and move in their communities. And Lord, we lay those to you, knowing that you know our disappointments and you know our frustrations. But Spirit, would you not allow our faith to die and pass away? Would you bring, would you restore us again? Would you revive us again? Would you begin to show us anew what it means to seek you and your kingdom so that you would break through? So we bless you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on. And we'd love it if you would leave us a review.